السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Now, welcome back to Huda Hajj day to day um, Alhamdulillah, we are in these blessed days And uh, we're here this evening We've been blessed to be here this evening with two guests uh, We're going to be speaking about um, Hajj, of course And we're going to be speaking about... Um, really the the reasons for hajj and understanding these inshallah and may allah bless our conversation and hopefully it will be an insight uh, uh for you uh, these lessons that we can really learn from hajj inshallah so without any further ado let me introduce the guests inshallah we have ali falalu uh, yeah exactly thank you so much mr uh, well, nice welcome meeting back. you nice to meet uh, you it's very good to uh, be here again with you brother it, thank you so much and we have we have mudathir hussein sir thank you so much <laughs> it's nice <laughs> to be here thanks uh, for you nice and to be here with you for inviting me here once again alhamdulillah alhamdulillah so we're talking about lessons from hajj yeah. um things that we can learn from hajj yeah. inshallah uh, perhaps uh, Allah will bless us to have a good show this evening Inshallah. and uh, you know expound and get some insight into this the lessons that we can learn from Hajj so go go ahead brother share with us uh, some lessons inshallah mm -hmm. that we can learn from Hajj well uh, bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh, uh, actually speaking when talking about the lessons that uh, a muslim should learn or can learn about the hajj uh, you, you we we are now talking about um, you know many lessons uh, a number of lessons that a muslim can learn when it comes to do with the fifth uh, pillars of uh, of islam islam has five pillars okay the fifth of them is Hajj, the performance of Hajj for those who are capable of doing so. So when you talk about the lessons that we can extract from uh, from Hajj, you talk about uh, uh, first and foremost, you talk about the, the equality between people, that mm. uh, people according to a verse in Holy Quran, Almighty Allah say that inna khalaqnaakum min zakarin wa unsa wa jalna that Almighty Allah is saying that we have created you from man and woman and we made you into nations okay but there is no any priority amongst you the only one who is more you know who is more preparable according to Almighty Allah is the one who is more God fearing okay so there is no difference between white and black or between man and woman or between whatever so you can see in Hajj people are transcending the barriers of sex the barriers of nations the barriers of uh, of races okay coming together in order to you know do one thing from this lesson we can learn the unity of purpose the unity of mission the unity of Muslim Ummah they are coming from different nations from different continent of the world irrespective of their colors irrespective of their you know social status and when they arrive at Mecca they are going to wear the same cloth that's al ihram it is whitish no matter how rich you are no matter how poor you are no matter how king you are no matter how queen you are no matter how you know social status you are you need to succumb you need to you know abide by the rules and regulation laid by almighty allah in unifying people that people before or in accordance to almighty allah are the same just like the teeth in the comb they are the same but the only one who is preparable is the one who is fearing almighty allah very well so we can learn the lesson of uh, 
of unity among Muslim Ummah. Okay, we can also learn the unity of sacrifice. That someone is leaving his country, is leaving his family, is leaving his wife, is is leaving his children, and so on. Okay, to travel, you know, crossing thousands of kilometers to come to Mecca in order to, you know, answer the call of Almighty Allah. This is where it, or oh, this how it started right from the beginning during the time of uh, Prophet Ibrahim when Almighty Allah asked him to move his family his wife okay Hajar he Almighty Allah asked him to move her from uh, from some place in Palestine to move her to to a place in Mecca Mecca then was a scorching desert there was no water there was no plantations there was nothing but Abraham or Prophet Ibrahim accepted and agreed to do so because Almighty Allah has asked him to do so. This one is a sign of sacrifice. We also saw Abraham when Almighty Allah, when he got a baby kid, that Ismail from Hajar. Almighty Allah trained him and asked him to do another sacrifice. The sacrifice of slaughtering his son. Almighty Allah asked him to, to slaughter his son as he has seen that in the dream. And he came and told his kid Ibrahim Ismail that I have seen in the dream, the dream of prophet is real okay so he has seen that in the dream that almighty allah was asking him to slaughter his to sacrifice his son that's to slaughter him and he came and told uh, ismail ismail what did he tell his father he said that my dad do what almighty allah asks you to do that salute me because by doing that you are accepting the order of almighty allah likewise me i'm accepting the order of almighty allah of doing that this one is a sacrifice we can see another sacrifice in the wife the hajar who was very young then she was less than 20 years old and she was taken alone from palestine to mecca without water and she was pregnant she had labor okay the place was very drought was very dry without water but she when she asked her husband ibrahim why are you going to take me from palestine where there is food and water and moving me to 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 mecca a scorching desert with heat sun why are you going to do that he told her it is almighty allah that asked me to do so so by so doing she say okay if almighty allah is the one who accepts you who asked you to do so i will never be any reluctant to accept i will never be any you know yeah exactly she accepted herself so we can learn unity we can learn you know unity of purpose we can learn that we are all equal irrespective of colors irrespective of sex irrespective of social studies and whatever according to almighty allah we are the same the most preferable is the one who is more almighty allah fearing and we can you know learn the lesson of sacrifice Sacrifice. that we leave everything and we come to and this is something that i mean we can not only learn but we can i mean when we learn lessons Mm -hmm. we apply lessons right it is not something to learn and brother uh, Mudathir, maybe you can expound on this because this is this, we just have a wealth of uh, mm. a wealth of things to really learn from Hajj that can really help us, uh, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wal Mursaleen. Amma bad, fa'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahi rahman rahim Brother Ali has elaborated and discussed the all. Uh, major lesson that we can extract from the journey of faith like unity equality and sacrifice and simplicity he elaborated very well but uh, as we can extract a lot of lessons from the journey of Hajj I also want to point out a major and a big lesson that we can extract from the journey of faith which is Tawheed and <coughs> which is Tawheed, that there is no God than Allah. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is the last messenger of Allah. He is the only God who is the maintainer of life, who is the sustainer of life, who is giving us life, who can take everything from us at any time. He is the powerful and almighty Allah who deserves to be worshipped. This is message of Tawheed that we can extract from the Hajj. 
because our prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam he says that tomorrow we are going to celebrate yawmul arafa he says that ahsan ma qult that the beautiest thing and the beautiest sentence that ever ever has been called by ana wan nabiyun i have said it and all the prophets have said it what is this this is message of tawhid said la ilaha illallah there is no god but allah wahdahu he is the only one la sharika lahu he has no partner no partner lahu al mulk uh, whole world is for allah wa lahu al hamd every praise for allah wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer and he is almighty on everything of this world and like that when we see that several hujjaj pilgrims pilgrims they are going to offer the pilgrimage in the <coughs> makkatul mukarrama they said their slogan is that labbaik allahumma labbaik labbaik this sentence has been called for someone who has been beloved and you like to answer him very quickly and very freely you said yes i am here for you labbaik allahumma labbaik la sharika lak labbaik This is the main slogan that there is no partner of Allah. I want to tell you one more point here that all of our worships in the shape of uh, prayers in the shape of zakat in the shape of hajj Allah tbarak wa subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need it. Humanity and human beings needs these worships. How that we can see we can see that several in other religions religions from the skies or religions created by humans house hindus for example they have <coughs> made everything everything powerful in this world they have made it god for example elephant is their god uh, sun is their god even if you will see that and you will study that you will see that all parts of body they have made in god for themselves but allah says no it's not like said says to the kufar and says to the disbelievers qul ya ayyuhal kafirun la a'budu ma ta'budun when ever you perform the umrah after after performing the umrah it's supposed to be that you have to pray to nawafil and in these two nawafil you have to pray and you have to offer this surah qul ya ayyuhal kafirun says to the disbeliever that there is no god but allah i am not going to worship your gods that's why sayyidna ibrahim he has extracted out all of gods made by stones from the kaabatullah and sent them outside our prophet did so as from sayyidna adam till now every prophet their duty of the messenger is that he has to be worshiped of one allah and to deliver the message that there is no god but allah and no one is partner of him so the main message of uh, uh, and main lesson of hajj is that that we have to pray for allah who deserve our worship no one in this world deserve our uh, worship mashallah so uh, when i'm listening to you brother speaking yeah. we have tawhid which is you know the oneness worshiping Allah alone yeah without any partners knowing that Allah has the power then making the sacrifice mm. to fulfill the commandments of Allah and Allah what is he telling us even in the the um last sort of program before this one and you saw the shaykh you saw the brothers talking about the love of brotherly love Yeah. Allah has commanded us the Muslims to love each other as or you know love for your brother what you love for yourself you know so we are sacrificing we are we are putting ourselves or uh, really Allah has put us on one level playing field you know yeah. and we are equal and the only one who is better than the other one is through their own taqwa their piety their god consciousness mm. and Allah really only knows that you know yeah. so the sacrifice this tawhid the sacrifice mm. this this equality uh this this sharing of the 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 dunya the life and just getting in this one uniform mm. and these mashallah these are jewels yeah. i mean now practically when you look at these things this tawhid this sacrifice how can this help us in our life our day day to day life and perhaps inshallah like we're in the studio but maybe we can be 
on Arafat <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next year by using these jewels, by using yeah. these tools. Uh, could you talk about this a little bit, inshallah? Well, eh, virtually speaking, you are now alluding to something of uh, vital importance, something very significant, that we have got so many tools, we have got so many weapons, so to say, that we can utilize that if we can use them perfectly, okay? There is no force that can hinder Islam. There is no obstacle that can stop, you know, from allowing Islam to move and prosper. For example, the concept of unity. Okay, I would like to set an example. There was very popular, well-celebrated American activist, uh, uh, popularly known as uh, Malcolm X, okay, Alaji Malik Shabazz. Okay, uh, if you look at the background of his history, he suffered the racism in America and he happened to be one of the most active you know, fighters against racism and so on, and he became Muslim. And he became Muslim, but still he had this kind of uh, scars of racism that he suffered in the United States. Yeah. Then he happened to travel to, to, to Mecca to perform Hajj, okay? Before he traveled to Mecca, he was thinking that the, the, the white people, whitish people, with uh, especially the blonde among them, or the blue eyes among them, are a sign or replica of of devil okay he hated them very much but when he went to Mecca he saw people of different colors he saw himself you know in front of Mecca in front of Kaaba with people who are, were having blue eyes with blonde hairs he said that oh my god Islam is not like that Islam is very inclusive Islam is the home not only for the black people not only for the Arab not only for the blonde not only for Islam came in order to encapsulate in order to contain every people so when he went back to America he had to preach his people that no racism Islam is the first religion which fought racism okay you are one of God or you are man of God if as long as you love God or you fear God irrespective of your color you could be black you could be you know white you could be blonde you could be with blue eyes you could be with brown eyes whatsoever these colors are not what matter but what matters is what you are doing and the relationship between you and Almighty Allah Therefore, if Muslim community and Muslim Ummah are going to enact and utilize these tools, the tools of unity, there are more than 2 billion Muslims around the world. If they are going to use that, that unity in them, okay, today is the day of Tarwi, according to in the Mecca. Tomorrow is going to be the day of Arafah, okay? This is going to be like an Anos Mirabilis day as far as Muslim Ummah are concerned. So it is it is going to be like a very big celebration if we're going to see our unity for those who are in mecca they are united irrespective of their nations and irrespective of their colors and so on for those who at home like us now we're going to perform siyam we're going to perform fasting in order to join them so if muslims are going to utilize this thing they are going to be the most influential nation in the world irrespective of the enemies irrespective of the skepticals irrespective of those who are tarnishing the image of Islam. That's why, you know, Prophet Muhammad say that. al Hajju Arafah. Hajj or pilgrimage is nothing but Arafah. Why? Because Arafah is the day that's tomorrow. Is the day where which you're going to see Muslims, irrespective of whatever they are doing, moving together. You can see the president of your country moving with you, dressing the same color of cloth, wow. you know, moving from here to there, because you know, Hajj is also movement. You know, Tawaf, Sa'i, between Safa and Marwa, okay, and all these things, moving to Mina, it's a movement. Almighty Allah is trying to tell you that. You are equal. That's why in the last sermon, in the life of Prophet Muhammad, he said that, there is no difference amongst you, O Muslims. There is no difference between someone who is 
is from Arabia and someone who is not from Arabia. There is no difference between someone who is Quraysh and someone who is not Quraysh. There is no difference between those who are white and those who are not white. You are all equal. But the one who is the most significant amongst you is the one who is more pious, who has a lot of piety, who is fearing God. So Prophet Muhammad, you know, left and you know, delivered his sermon, yeah. telling people that they should feel that they are equal. And equality. like you know, said, equality. Yes. Correct. Okay. So let's use this power we have, the power of unity. Okay. One second. Now we have a report. Mm. I want to continue this. This is a charged energy field conversation. <laughs> and um, inshallah, we have a report. Um, I want to thank you, Ali, for the speaking. And I want to both of you brothers. And um, inshallah, we're going to enjoy this report. And we're going to come back after this, inshallah. Thank you, Chuck. Arafa is an Arabic word that means to recognize or know. Technically, Arafa is an open plain that is located in Mecca. Pilgrims assemble in Arafa every year to perform the rites of Hajj. There are different interpretations on why the pilgrims assemble in this place. None of these interpretations were authenticated by solid textual evidence that can be traced to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. One theory explains that Arafah was the place where Adam and Eve met once again after they were sent down from the heavens to reside on earth. They came down on two different spots, but eventually met and recognized each other in this plane. Since Arafah means to recognize, it is based on the opinion that some scholars say this plane of land was called Arafah. A second theory explains that the angel Jibra'il came down to the Prophet Ibrahim salam in this place in order to teach him the rituals of Hajj. Jibra'il took the Prophet Ibrahim on a tour around the holy sites. With every ritual explained, Jibra'il would ask Ibrahim, Arraft, which means, Did you understand? Ibrahim would reply saying, Yes, Arraft, which means, Yes, I understood. That is why Arafah, which is the most important ritual of Hajj, was called Arafah, to know and learn. A third point of view states that Arafah literally means to know and it is a name for the place where the pilgrims from every corner of the globe get to know one another. That is why the place is called Arafah. Finally, some scholars explain that Arafah is an Arabic word that is derived from Arf, which means fragrance. During Hajj season, the plain of Arafah is filled with spiritual arf or fragrance. That is why it is called Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. Arafah is the greatest day in Hajj. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, after delivering his famous speech, he ordered that his camel will be prepared. It was settled for him. Then he rode it. He came to these rocks stood there and he said, I have stood here and all Arafah is a place to stand in. Standing here means staying rather than the literal meaning of standing. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, spent all that time, afternoon until sunset, raising his hands and invoking Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. He was not involved in any, in any act of worship other than invoking and supplicating to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. The companions disputed whether he was fasting or not. So his uncle's wife, Umm al-Fadl, she sent him some milk, so he drank from, from it. So they knew that he was not fasting. In fact, it was reported that while he was invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was raising his hands, the rope in which he was holding his camel, fell from his hand. So he kept raising one of his hands, and he retook the robe with the other hand. This is the greatest day 
in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the worldly heaven. And he asks the angel, what do my slaves want? And he knows best. They reply and say, they came and they gathered seeking your forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be the witness that I have forgiven them all. One of the prominent scholars of Muslims, he was asked, who is the worst person in this place? He said, the worst person in this place is the one who thinks that Allah will not forgive him. Imagine that all these thousands or hundreds of thousands of people came to one of the kings of this worldly life. And all of them, they are begging him one cent. And he is a generous king. Is he going to give them this cent? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more generous to give them his mercy. There is no day better in the sight of Allah than the day of Arafah. On this day, Allah descends to the nearest heaven and he takes pride in the pilgrims and says to the angels in his presence, Look at my servants. They have come from every distant place and they look untidy and dusty. They have come here in pursuit of my mercy, even though they have never seen my punishment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you and welcome back. What a beautiful report. Just, you know, watching and learning. Alhamdulillah. Now, we're back. Uh, we're back here. And alhamdulillah. And uh, we're here with another guest, Hisham Izzat. And he joins us tonight with Brother uh, Mudathir uh, Hussein. Uh, so, we're going to switch the mood a little bit, switch the mode. And we're going to talk a little bit about the day of Arafah which is tomorrow, some of the things that we should do, the uh, significance of it, and lessons that we can learn from this as well, inshallah. So, brothers, if you could just go ahead and uh, begin to expound on this, and perhaps, inshallah, we can uh, better our understanding. Bismillah, uh, salatu wassalamu rasulullah. The day of Arafah actually is one of the most important days that comes along the, uh, the whole year for the Muslim. I think the most two important days is the day of Arafah and the Laylatul Qadr mm. is the night of Al Qadr. And the Laylatul Qadr is from the Maghrib till the till the dawn. While the day of Arafah starts from from the Maghrib till the next Maghrib. Yani it, sh- it should be start from now that you prepare yourself for the for the for the morning of Arafah and uh, till the, the Maghrib. Uh, Arafah, w- the day of Arafah was a very important day. Is the day that, uh, first of all, Allah took the covenant from the, all the sons of Adam at that day. And uh, in the, the famous verse of the Quran in, the cha- in uh, Surah Al-Araf, that he took from the back of Adam the loan of, his, of the seeds of all the human beings that will be created. And he talked to them. And, you, and we talked to our Lord. He said, Alastu Barabbikum. I'm, I'm not your Lord. We all testified that we said yes. So this, this was happened in, in the day of Arafah. The day of Arafah is the day in which the last verse of the Quran has been revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. And one of the Jews went to Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was a Khalifa and he said there was a verse that if it was revealed to us, we Jews, we would take that day as, as, as a festival day. He said, so which verse is it? He said, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. When Allah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the day of Arafah that today I perfected your religion and I completed my, 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 my blessings on you and I'm satisfying Islam as a religion for you. So Umar ibn Khattab said, I know this verse, I know where it, it was revealed, it was in the day of Arafah. Uh, the day of Arafah, Prophet Sallallahu had made a sunnah for the people who are, who are not in Hajj to fast the day of Arafah. And he said, if you fasted, uh, Allah would forgive the, 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 the prior year that you passed and the next, and the next year, two years. For 14 hours of fasting, 
would forgive uh, two complete tears. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's such amazing. And one of the things the Prophet ﷺ said about the Arafah, he said, Khayr dua, dua yaw marfa. The best dua that you make is dua yaw marfa. This is the day of dua, that you make a lots of dua. And he said, the best of what I said and all the Prophets said, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. I think This is one of the best dua that you say in, in the day of, uh, of Arafah. Uh, the day of Arafah, you have to quit as much as you can all the, the sins. Uh, there is a hadith on the pro- of the Prophet Sallallahu that Al-Fudayl ibn Abbas, his cousin, he was with him in the day of Arafah. And the guy was looking to the women because the women in, in the Hajj, they, they should uh, uh, show their faces. So Prophet ﷺ was switching his face from time to time in order to prevent him from looking. So he told him, he told him, this is a day, Al-Fudayl, this is a day, the one who, who will quit the sins by his tongue, by his eyes, by his, by his, by his hands or whatever, so Allah would forgive him. So one condition that, uh, that Allah would forgive you is to, to quit those things. Uh, Prophet ﷺ said that there is no day in, in the whole year that Allah forgive as many of his servants as in the day of Arafah. So we have to consume these meanings and to prepare our night with, with a, a nice prayer at night in order in which we, 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 we supplicate to Allah that he accepts our dua in the morning, in the day of Arafah. Uh, one of the, the acts of a salaf, a salihun, the, our ancestors, uh, regarding the day of Arafah, they, were, they knew, they understood the value of that day. Mm. One, uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he, was, he saw Sufyan al-Thawri, one of the very famous tabi'i, he saw him on his knees weeping, crying, and making a dua in the day of Arafah. So he asked him, Sufyan al-Thawri, he asked him, you told him, do you see from those 100,000 people, do you know who's the worst man amongst them? He told him, who? He said, the one who thinks that Allah will, will not forgive him in that day. So it's, so it's kind of certainty that you have to, to, to get once you make the dua, uh, when, once you supplicate to Allah, that Allah would, would answer your, your prayer. So I hope that we, in that day, we, we do our best in that day. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. I mean, inshallah. inshallah. This is, uh, mashallah, it's valuable. You see how valuable yeah. it is with all of this information. Uh, this, this day seems to be extremely valuable for yeah. us. Um, a, a beautiful day in which we can supplicate and ask Allah and inshallah get forgiveness. Brother, do you have anything to add to this? Well, uh, that was a quite very beautiful explanation and comprehensively said by Brother Hisham. Yes. Uh, as I was feeling that uh, this spiritual journey, and I wish to be there at Yom al Arafah, I have some spiritual feeling right now about that day, how spiritual it is, and what, when, uh, what can we do. Obviously, all, all if we can see the Hajj, uh, all this journey of faith, if we can see it, I will want to put it in this way that Hajj, if uh, we have three alphabets of English, H, A, and J, and I will say that H stands for humanity, and A stands for awareness, awareness of which? Awareness of Allah and His Messenger, Prophet peace be upon him. And J stands for its Judiciary Day, Day of Judgment, Judgment Day, Day of Resurrection, so, first of all, we have discussed the lesson of Hajj as a equality, simplicity, and Tawheed. Like that, I would like to add more on this, that uh, H stands for humanity. Which humanity? As Brother Ali before discussed about racism. The world is fighting for and want to eliminate the racism from two or three centuries. But Islam has eliminated completely and clearly says that uh, white, uh, blue, blonde or a black African and the last sermon of our prophet I will say that it is the, cho- it is the charter of human rights that's the humanity and that's the human rights Islam is teaching to the Muslims and all, all humans of this world how? that a pilgrims 
when he started to travel from his home and doing all the rituals of the Hajj, he had to take care of others. He had to take care of old ones. He had to take care of the children. So these are the human rights as a school, Hajj as a school of learning. Uh, Hajj is teaching us human rights how we have to respect other. I have once been experience of uh, Umrah and I have seen thousands of pupils, millions of people, they are walking together. And if someone, if someone hit with another one or push another one, uh, all the pupils will stand. And if uh, an expression of anger comes on any one face, all the people will say that we are in tawaf, forgive it. This is the human rights lesson that Hajj is teaching to us that in the age where all nations are uh, fighting to eliminate the racism in this way Islam is giving an example a sample to whole communities whole societies that look towards us see towards us that we as a Muslim one from Turkey one from USA one from subcontinent Pakistan or India we are collecting here together and we are giving you an example of unity and to eliminate the racism from the society. This is the first lesson of H, humanity. And the second one, awareness. I want to add one thing more here that uh, I have uh, discussed about Tawheed. That some of the Orientalists and the people, non-Muslim, who, uh, uh, who criticize the Islam, that we are worshipping of stones, Muslims are also worshipping of, uh, of Kaabatullah. It has been also made of stones. This is the misconception and misunderstanding. I want to clarify it, that we are not going to worship the uh, Baitullah. We are going to worship of Allah. As our Allah, Almighty Allah says that, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ That we are going to worship of the Rabb and the God of this home. Not to this home. This home is only for direction and to uh, unite all the Muslims from all over the world in one direction and worship is only for Allah. And for the second, uh, A stands for awareness. Awareness of which? Awareness of religion, awareness of uh, your God, awareness of messengers, awareness of journey of faith mm -hmm. that what Sayyidina Ibrahim and what Sayyidina Ismail, Sayyidina Hajar, Sayyidina Adam, what, did, what are the rituals they have performed and what are the hardships they have faced in this uh, beautiful place. And the third one that I want to discuss is the judgmental day. Uh, that one humanity, we, we have discussed how can, how can uh, we expand uh, the human rights among the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And the third one is the day of resurrection that how can uh, we perform the Hajj and we can get the lessons from the Hajj and so we could be beneficiary and we can be succeed at the day of Qiyamah, day of resurrection. Inshallah. And Inshallah. You know, it's, it's speaking about the day of resurrection. You know, yeah. And you guys can confirm this for me. It's like a rehearsal. The day of Arafat, they say, is like uh, a precursor to the day of resurrection, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're wearing the white as if it's their burial shrouds, you know. And we, you know, I said, we beg Allah like I'm there, right? But, uh, inshallah, but the people there, you know, they beg Allah to forgive them, you know, and beg Allah because, you, we, I mean, many of these people, you never know, this may be their last day, yeah. their last week, or their yeah. last year. Uh, we don't know uh, when, you know, we will go. But, um, you know, when you speak of the Day of Resurrection, and Arafat and that connection, um, you know, Allah knows best uh, what that connection truly is, but that's definitely an opportunity uh, for the people there. Now, when we think in terms of things that we do on Arafat, like uh, the day of Arafat, not the place of Arafat, um, like for us who are not there, okay, we're fasting, we're making dua, we're making extra supplication, but other than that, as far as you understand, do we just go about our regular day if we have work? We just go to work. We do what we usually do, but we, we keep Allah in remembrance and we make extra, extra supplication. We're fasting. If we have, uh, is it also a time to do extra good deeds, 
feeding people and such. And as far as our regular day to day, we do, do we go about doing our work and just doing our, our as far as you understand. Uh, thanks God, tomorrow's a day off here in Egypt, so <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, so the holiday, you don't have yeah. any pretext to say that yeah. I, I have an eight-hour uh, day of work, so I'm, I, will, I will not be focused to do so, and so no, yeah. it's a day off. So in that day, yeah, you, you still have a time that you make a variety of worshipping in which it will, it will soften your heart and make your dua to be accepted, because if you'll stay the whole day making lots of dua without uh, without your heart is being prepared w wouldn't wouldn't work but if your heart's prepared and you just made just one honest uh, dua like uh, oh god for forgive all my sins maybe if this one is accepted it's uh, it's an amazing thing so some of the the people who arrange this day they start from the prayer the night prayer and they fast the day and for the whole day after each prayer the the which is the duhr and al-asr they they may stay like one hour in the in the in the masjid to to recite the Quran and they make the dua, and it's I think it's it's very good if we if we can stay from Asr to to to, to Al Maghrib till the last moment of of that day in in the mosque to to focus more and to to get ourselves out of any distraction would happen from the material life like some phone calls emails or or whatever. It's, it will be it will be the best. I hope I I I, I advise myself first if I if I can do this tomorrow, it will be better for me. So it's the day when you see even when you see the people of Arafah. I, I love to watch the television to see the dua of day of Arafah and watch the the Hajj. I may say hours watching the people because uh, I I get many values of it. When you see by the helicopter the the mountain of Arafah and the three millions are gathered on this mountain, it's uh, and all what they are doing from dawn to to to, to Maghrib is just asking God to forgive them and asking God for for whatever they need. You you see that this is the day of the dua. This is the day that that Allah dedicated as you the dua is being more accepted from people so you have to get the advantage of that day as Allah made the month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran get the advantage of the Quran in that month as Allah made the, the Monday and Thursday as, as, as for, 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 for the fasting if you fast you'll get more rewards so you have to understand the, what, what, as what they call nafahat or the bonuses of Allah uh, over, uh, over the year you understand yes, yes. so this is the day of the dua mainly the dua which is you, you ask God you see the so, day, yeah, yeah, let me just ask you a question about this because it just came to mind. Now, I understand that, and you can expound on this more. the The way they pray the salat on Arafat is different. The timing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like you know, we have our regular five salat a day, you know, and there the salat is at its stated times, you know, not on Arafat. But now, what is the difference? There is a difference on the day of Arafat for the pilgrims who are there, correct? Yeah. What is this exactly? Actually, it's in the in the whole Hajj. The Prophet was, well, he he made the Jam and Qasr, which is a combined Al Dhuhr and Al Asr, mm -hmm. and he pray uh, each one of them as a two rakahs, not four rakahs. And you can pray Dhuhr and Asr at the time of Dhuhr, or a Dhuhr and Asr in the time of Al Asr. So you have an extended uh, extended hours of performing those two prayers, mm -hmm. and this is a mercy of God. Yeah. And this is permissible also in the time of, of, of traveling for a, a, a big distances that you reduce the prayer and combine them. Yeah. And you're allowed just to reduce Al-Dhuhr and Asr and to, to pray them in, in, in one of the, uh, of, of the time of Al-Dhuhr and Asr and the Maghrib and Al-Isha. And the Maghrib you pray three, three rakahs as it is and Al-Isha two rakahs. And you may pray them at the time of Al-Maghrib or at the time of Al-Isha. This is a kind of easiness because the people in the Hajj they are, they, are, they, they have many things to do, yes. so it's not it's not that easy for them to pray the uh, the time by uh, the full rakat in their time. Right, so right. it's a it's a mercy from God to pray uh, to, to to combine the prayers and to shorten them. Mashallah. In the time of Hajj and in the time of, of traveling as well. Okay, okay. So this is for traveling yeah. and for Hajj. Now, okay. So is it? Well, we'll get it. I'm not going to get too deep into it because then I'm trying to get my own. No, even, even even the people of when the Prophet ﷺ shortened the the prayer, mm -hmm. even the people of Mecca, 
that they lived in Mecca and they came for Hajj, mm -hmm. they followed the, the Prophet ﷺ and they shortened and they combined the prayer. Right. And the Prophet ﷺ did not tell them anything. So it's also for the people of Mecca, as the scholars, they, they got the understanding. Even Mashallah. the people of Mecca, they can shorten and combine the prayer. MashaAllah. And this is, inshallah, gives you more time for, for supplication. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So you're saying uh, condition yourself yeah. for the day of Arafat and condition your heart with uh, the night prayer and the fasting and uh, try to be sincere as possible that Allah will uh, forgive us, cleanse us. I mean, I mean, Okay, do you brothers have anything else to add? I mean, this is, mashallah, this is a, it's tomorrow, inshallah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, we'll be fasting, inshallah, inshallah. And, and praying that Allah, you know, He really forgives us now. I understand, actually, we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, alhamdulillah, may Allah, you know, cause us uh, to make hajj. I mean, at least myself, I haven't made it yet. I don't know about you brothers. But, um, cause us to make hajj, and, uh, you know, that's accepted uh, by Him, inshallah, and cry to Him <laughs> on this field of, of, of Arafat that He uh, forgives us, inshallah. inshallah. May Allah bless us all with a successful day tomorrow and Amen. accept our dua and the dua of all the, the sincere Muslims. Um, but we got to go. <laughs> got to go condition ourselves, <laughs> inshallah. Yeah. May Allah help us. Thank, um, you, very much. thank you for joining us. Thank you. I thank you to guests. Uh, uh, and inshallah, may Allah accept, uh, may accept this meeting and may inshallah. accept our deeds tomorrow, inshallah. inshallah. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.